So good afternoon, everyone. And I am uh, deeply honored to introduce the last speaker at this year's summer school, Professor Lawrence Buell. Um, Professor Buell certainly will not remember this, but we met once in Coimbra, I believe the last time he came to Portugal, uh, to a conference of the Portuguese Association of English and American Studies. And that was a memorable moment to us all. I believe this was 2002. Um, uh, Professor Buell is uh, Paul Cabot Professor of American Literature at Harvard and, as we all know, one of the foremost thinkers in eco-criticism, someone who truly transformed the playing field of American studies. His work has introduced what are now household tools in environmental studies, such as the idea of the environmental imagination or the environmental unconscious, expanding notions such as the ecological idea, um, and also his very uh, important work on uh, Rachel Carson's uh, notion of the toxic discourse, or even other notions such as the ethics of land stewardship and the idea of the watershed imagination, which was deeply influential for my own work. I came across Professor Buell's work as a young Fulbrighter at the Center for Maritime Cultures of the University of Michigan, in 2001, actually, working on the imagination of the Great Lakes. This was 2001, as I said, and uh, by that time, Professor Buell had already published his impressive The Environmental Imagination, Thoreau, Nature Writing, and the Formation of American Literature from 96, and precisely in that year, 2001, Writing for an Endangered World, Literature, Culture, and Environment in the US and Beyond. Um, to pick up on his terms, it was one of those watershed moments uh, in academic life, coming across his uh, vision um, and uh, the way he uh, read American literature in light of uh, a new notion of the environmental imagination. And it was precisely this uh, light that he brought to the meeting in Coimbra um, for uh, the young academics and the more senior ones who were gathered in that room listening to a, also a, a closing talk uh, for the event. It was something that touched the hearts and the, the minds of uh, the young American studies scholars or the more senior ones. Uh, what is held today as common knowledge that the environmental imagination has cultural, social, and political significance, that it does not stop short at the edge of the woods, and I'm quoting Professor Buell, but is present in all aspects of social interaction, had in Lawrence Buell one of its most extraordinary heralds. His work shows that environmental consciousness and the politics of preservation require not only coherence of vision in policy, but also an array of images, narratives, representations that can tell the beauty and the suffering of our common household and lead to a general change of mindset. Amongst his many awards are the J. Hubel Medal for Lifetime Achievement in American Literary Studies, the highest professional award that the American Literature Section of the Modern Languages Association can give, uh, also the Warren Brooks Awards, which he won in 2003 for Outstanding Literary Criticism for his book on Emerson, and uh, as the already mentioned Writing for an Endangered uh, world won in 2001 the John Cowell Award for the best book in the field of American culture studies. Amongst his many, many other publications, and I will quote just a few, are uh, Shades of the Planet from 2007, Nature and the City, and Thesis are Symbiosis from 2009, uh, Echo Criticism, Some Emerging Trends from 2012 and uses and abuses of environmental memory from 2013. At this time uh, of very, this very strange time we we're living in, uh, at a time of pandemic, uh, his work is more relevant than ever. Professor Buell, thank you very much for this new remote visit to Portugal and to the Lisbon Consortium, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone, uh, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, but um, this is our necessary recourse. And I'm grateful to be invited 
Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rector Schill, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm now thinking, will I disappoint? Uh, but um, that remains to be seen. Uh, it's uh, so moving to hear you uh, talk about your own uh, odyssey in connection with my own, which is exactly what uh, for an old scholar, uh, one's career should be all about. Uh, but looking ahead, uh, I should alert you that uh, like all my public lectures, uh, this one is a, a mixture of thoughts previously ruminated and work in progress, thoughts in progress. Uh, it's a thought experiment. Uh, like uh, some of mine in the past, it's taken me to some conclusions that I did not uh, expect and in some ways don't particularly welcome. Uh, and yet, um, it seems uh, right enough to me now, uh, but like all thought experiments, uh, subject to correction as well. And I hope that uh, when I'm through, uh, you'll all be utterly frank in uh, offering up um, questions or critiques that will uh, help me forward and uh, I hope uh, help us all. So reflections on post-pandemic ecoculture. How might the current pandemic experience affect the future of world ecoculture? What new prospects, new pathways, new narratives might this experience we're going through suggest? And the discourse of pandemic, what might it suggest? Discourses, I should say. What should we make of the spectacle of the one major unprecedented environmental crisis displaced by another? Uh, that is the effect of the largest epidemic outbreak in the history of modern medicine in shifting public attention away from uh, the crisis of the Anthropocene, climate change, global warming, uh, which until six months ago was agreed to be the most preeminent 21st century environmental concern. My talk today will treat the two crises as symbiotic and mutually illuminating, despite any appearances to the contrary, both as symbiotic historically, as we find in the links between pandemic outbreaks and climate change over time. Uh, and beyond that, uh, equally important for us as students of environmental arts, humanities, and media, also linked discursively by reason of the analogies between them as very disastrous scenarios. I'll be unfolding this in four stages, four unequal parts. And uh, here's the first. In order to perceive how they are mutually illuminating, however, these discourses, these histories, we need to start by granting the obvious contrast between the two kinds of crisis, pandemic and global warming. And three, I will mention especially. First, in planetary reach, both crises extend worldwide, but climate change affects all forms of life in the entire Earth system, whereas COVID-19 uh, presents itself as a human-specific crisis exclusively. Secondly, in temporal scale, Climate crisis works its way through processes of slow violence, to use Rob Nixon's useful term um, in his book on uh, the immiseration of uh, the third world environmentally and economically. Uh, climate change works its way through slow violence, whereas uh, COVID poses a much more sudden and immediate danger, clearly, at least to human beings. Infection and mortality rates are scary and rising fast, by contrast to which global warming is much more a crisis of anticipation whose force will fully be felt for many years. And then third, in familiarity, if I may put 
it that way. Humans have endured pandemics since before the dawn of history, whereas the Anthropocene is a late 20th century phenomenon not even named until 20 years ago. It has this appearance of a more radically new thing. So the use value of pandemic experience, pandemic discourse, for confronting the intellectual challenges of climate crisis is hardly self-evident. It's not surprising that historical and fictional treatments of pandemics have traditionally framed them as threats to empires and sometimes even human survival, but not as affecting the health of the planet as such. And so it is with the two classic 20th century epidemic novels, Tammuz, The Plague, and Saramago's Blindness, as well as with the classic scholarly history of the most lethal disease outbreak in world history, still uh, the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. Environmental historian Albert Crosby's book, America's Forgotten Pandemic, 1976. For Crosby, the most far-reaching damage caused by the Spanish flu, apart from the mortality toll of the tens of millions and maybe more, was disrupting the negotiations of the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. And that assessment is very much in keeping with the telltale moment in the most popular and enduring 20th century American plague survivor novel, George Stewart's novel, Earth Abides. Near the close, the main character pays a visit to his long deserted university library and discovers a book he checked out and read just before the disaster called Climate Through the Ages. And he remembers liking it at the time, but now he casts it aside as irrelevant, obsolete, of no use whatsoever. Climate change is not a practical problem, he thinks. And from the traditional standpoint, the reaction was understandable. The two domains simply didn't seem to have to, anything to do with each other. Today, however, uh, the assumption that pandemic history and climate history are unrelated is no longer axiomatic. And the feedback loops between pandemics and climate change seem increasingly consequential. Which brings me to my longest section on reciprocities. On the one hand, it now seems incontestable that pandemics can produce large enough environmental effects to affect climate. Lately, we've literally seen dramatic confirmation how a sudden major cutback in fossil fuel consumption can produce dramatic improvement in atmospheric quality. And very quickly, in the striking media images of clear skies over Beijing uh, and the Himalayas visible from the first time in 30 years from the plains of North India. Never mind that these will almost surely turn out to be quite transient, that CO2 emissions in China returned to pre-pandemic levels more than a month ago. But the point is that the event happened. Possibly there will even be a long-term impact. A Harvard economist colleague of mine predicts that because of the epidemic, global peak emissions will be shown to have, have crested last year rather than four years hence, as he had originally thought. Although if so, I expect that it will less likely come from lower industrial production than from shifts from live to virtual workplaces, such as we're seeing right now. International conferences via Zoom may become the norm rather than the exception. And durably. Nor is this the first time in history that disease has affected climate. The still controversial argument seems to be gaining ground that the drop in global temperature at the nadir of the Little Ice Age in the 1600s was partly, uh, partly resulted from the depopulation of the Americas over the first century of colonization, when somewhere between 55 and 110 million people died chiefly from waves of epidemics, possibly as much as 25% of world population at the time, which in turn meant abandonment of the indigenous agricultural infrastructure and temporary megascale reforestation and carbon sequestration until the rise of large-scale Euro-settler 
agriculture more than made up for that. Meanwhile, on the other hand, the case for the reciprocal feedback loop seems even solider uh, for climate change as a trigger for epidemic. 17th century historians who study the relation between climate history and social history surmise that partly for that reason, extreme winter weather and or extreme drought at least partly explain the fall of the Ming Dynasty in China, the rise of the Dutch Republic, the extension of the African slave trade, and the failure of the first English colonies in Virginia, which happened to face the worst winters and worst droughts in a thousand years. The uh, citations in my handout by Parker, McNeil, and White are uh, examples of this new research. In our day, it's been further demonstrated and well publicized how global warming has caused such formerly tropical diseases as dengue and West Nile virus to migrate northward and to cause release of anthrax and maybe other lethal bacteria or viruses from thawing animal remains in Siberia. Most of these new threats, like those just named, are zoonotic. That is, they're transmitted through animal-human contact, as are the series of 21st century coronaviruses, MERS, SARS, and COVID-19. For them, the causal link between transmission spread and climate change isn't so direct as with dengue and the anthrax case, but they're indirectly linked through changes in species interaction between bats, birds, animals, and humans due to habitat destruction and urbanization, which themselves are climate change aggravators, as we know. So no wonder that in the past 15 years, we've seen a new wave of revisionist histories of the Spanish flu pandemic, including a new edition of Crosby's that links it to the recent rise of previously unknown viral diseases and predicts new outbreaks. One of these new books by science writer Laura Spinney especially emphasizes climate change as a potential factor and imagines future pandemic scenarios uncannily like what's happening now with COVID-19. Her speculative fiction of 2017, only yesterday, now seems positively prophetic. What's most telling about this example, though, is not that one historian's prediction came true sooner than she could have known, but that in order to make it, she needed to go beyond the empirical facts and take a leap of creative imagination. That's where the arts and humanities come in. That's where they always come in. The arenas of dream, image, metaphor, intuition, story, which in turn becomes prerequisite and stimulus to the desire, conviction, and purposeful action, both individual and collective, that make things happen, make movements happen. Accordingly, in recent years, it's fallen less to works of historical research than to works of imagination to dramatize the frightening synergy between pandemics and climate change. And I want now to hold up two American narratives of the past decade about imaginary pandemics to this end. One a film, the other a fiction. The first uh, is the film Contagion from 2011 that's once again gone viral, as probably many of you know, uh, many of you have seen it. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'd be curious uh, afterwards. The second is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Lawrence Wright's novel called The End of October, published just this spring. Neither is a particularly sophisticated performance. Both play to the mass market, both feature melodramatic thriller plots starring white male hero scientists who discover the vaccine that will rescue civilization from a pandemic that's killed millions and thrown the world into violence and social chaos. In each case, by resorting to the perilous experiment of self-injection. That's the theorem. So all of this is standard stuff for formula fiction. What's interesting for us is how 
both these works dramatize but then discredit the paranoid conspiracy theories predictably engendered by unknown plagues unleashed uh, in obscure outbacks of the non-Western world. So often the stuff of previous pandemic hits like the 90s film Outbreak, uh, the book on which it's based, um, Richard Preston's The Red Zone, and Preston's later novel, uh, The Cobra Event, which is the book that prompted President Bill Clinton, I just found this out a month ago, to start the US bioterrorism research program, prompted by a novel, wow. Um, Contagion and end of October both end with the revelation that epidemics and the panics that ensued were not dire plots perpetrated by foreign powers or manipulative national regimes, but came from animal-human contact due to Anthropocene environmental destabilizations. In Contagion, it's aggressive, distant, ag aggressive clearance of Chinese jungle which drives bats to shelter in pig farms that send their infected meat to urban kitchens. In end of October, it's the unfreezing in the Russian far north of the carcass of a woolly mammoth riddled with an ancient virus on which flocks of cranes feast before migrating south and infecting uh, the inmates of Indonesian detention camps. This too is not great art. From the standpoint of narratology, it's just another gimmick to the surprise ending. What makes it consequential for us uh, is the move to update pandemic narrative template uh, by infusing uh, the Anthropocene theme. Uh, and that in turn is symptomatic of the broader re-engineering of the cultural imaginary already underway that must in future advance much further in order for the people, societies, and regimes of the world fully to confront the gravity of global warming uh, robustly enough to arrest it enough for Earth's tropic and temperate zones to remain humanly habitable uh, in centuries to come. So I single out these two works of recent mass market fiction rather than, for example, the much more impressively artful, uh, sophisticated examples of higher end cli-fi climate fiction uh, that are also uh, springing up uh, on every continent. Uh, that is not to deny the potential for broader social impacts that might be exerted by more avant-garde experimental creative work, not only in film and literature, but also dance, theater, music, painting, sculpture, photography, or hybrid combinations of those. I've always myself been quite drawn to Ezra Pound's dictum, artists are the antennae of the race. Nice to think so. Although Pound uh, threatened to refute himself, of course, when his avant-garde sortie into classical Chinese poetics led him into uncritical admiration, first for Confucius and then Mussolini. Anyhow, popular media are self-evidently a better index of the present state of cultural imaginaries than, rapid, than radically inventive aesthetic breakthroughs are, uh, whose impacts aren't yet known. Uh, to be sure, uh, just one example, uh, the Cubist movement has had immense impact on shaping the way many of us live now in the shape of the physical spaces we inhabit, including the room from which I now speak. Uh, but it took decades for the Bauhaus and its successors to disseminate the forms of domestic and office architecture that now seem so familiar and efficient and aesthetically right. So going on to section three, uh, it's a kind of short excursus on the cultural work of environmental arts, humanities, and media itself. Um, it must be said. We hear a lot these days about the importance of so-called science-based decision-making, and with good reason, especially in countries like mine, whose president is a narcissistic demagogue who scorns the scientific community's advice to the consternation of um, the intelligent, educated public. Uh, any thoughtful actor in environmental arts, humanities, and media uh, 
works in awareness of the limits of his or her knowledge and knows when to defer to experts in other fields. We leave it to medical and public health professionals to discover vaccines and devise systems for distribution. But as my colleagues in quantitative fields often remind me, for knowledge to have impact requires not only notional assent, but decisive commitment and action, which knowledge alone cannot deliver. Sure, good decision-making presupposes an informed citizenry, but information alone won't catalyze the larger scale changes in public culture needed to bring about the needful techno-economic and policy transformations. The key to that lies in the realms of belief, ethics, imagination, rhetoric, our domains. Science alone is knowledge without power. Implementation depends on those who can inspire re-envisionment, conviction, and action on a large scale. Otherwise, it's just instrumental mechanics. This isn't to suggest that we cultural workers should try to transform ourselves into engineers. No, no, no. Uh, that's a temptation more to be resisted than indulged, as Ezra Pound learned to his cost. Uh, the distinguished success stories of people from the arts who um, assume political leadership, Václav Havel, Leopold Senghor in uh, Senegal, very, very rare, not to be emulated, I think, by uh, us ordinary mortals. So how to apply all this to the subject at hand? That is the interconnections between pandemic and climate change, both in history and in imagination as cultural discourses. This brings me to my last section, my concluding thoughts, and here they are. Two things at least are clear so far from what I've said. First, the domains of climate and pandemic formally thought separate are now increasingly understood as convergent. And acts of historical and creative imagination have helped achieve that breakthrough. Uh, the realization of anthropogenic disruption as a trigger for pandemics has started to spread well beyond the scientific research elite and embed itself in the popular cultural imaginary as it had not been the case 20 years ago, only 20 years ago. Still, secondly, the urgency of pandemic threats both as actuality and an imagination clearly continues to outcompete active concern for climate as the world scale, scale crisis par excellence, at least in the public eye. As those two fictions I discussed bear witness by deferring until the very end the revelation of anthropogenic causality, despite its being revealed as that which drives the entire plot machine. So looking ahead, the challenge for creative and critical work that would dramatize the gravity of climate crisis per se in the face of, of uh, competing concerns uh, is to infuse more compelling sense of urgency such that this slower moving, but ultimately much more momentous crisis becomes more strongly felt and less likely to be eclipsed by the crisis du jour. But well, most important, obviously, is simply to keep concentrated on the issue, regardless of distractions, and aware that we're in this for the very, very long haul. Uh, that remediation of a crisis so multidimensional and soluble only through major overhaul of world techno-economic and political orders is likely to take at least several generations, well beyond the lifetimes of us or our children. Meanwhile, though, the very discourse of pandemic emergency that now threatens to put climate concerns on hold may suggest, may suggest ways to make climate discourse more potent. This summer's protests against a far more longstanding crisis than either COVID or climate, the persistence of racism and gross inequalities between races in the United States and elsewhere, that's gained new momentum, partly by recasting itself as uh, recasting racism as a systemic disease of pandemic proportions and dramatizing the burden of oppression through images of suffocation, especially that notorious police chokehold, I can't breathe. 
Well, how about climate discourse? Um, can it learn lessons from this? I have four thoughts that I would like to throw out quickly um, and uh, hear your reactions and discussion. First, even though the threat global warming poses to human survival is tiny by comparison to the derangement it poses for the whole biophysical Earth system, nonetheless, in order to have decisive impact, climate discourse like pandemic discourse must be centrally, if not wholly, anthropocentric. As with pandemic discourse, the manifest threat to humans must be foregrounded. Whatever you privately believe about interspecies ethics and ontology, however consequential and convincing the claims of interspecies entanglement and webs of life and moral accountability by environmental theorists from Aldo Leopold to Donna Haraway and beyond, <clears throat> and I myself have um, supported this line of thinking. Uh, the case of pandemic imaginary suggests that for climate discourse to maximize its impact, those must be made subsidiary to anthropocentric lines of argument, narrative, rhetoric. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring is an instructive case here, the most influential work of environmental imagination in modern times. But it became so not so much because of its pleas on behalf of the natural world, eloquent and compelling though they are, as the demonstration that chemical pesticides had created a worldwide public health emergency. In other words, on the strength of its masterful deployment of what I and others after me have called toxic discourse. This in spite of the fact that Carson herself almost certainly cared far more personally about the health of natural systems than about the welfare of human society as such. Second and relatedly, although the threat posed by global warming to humanity is much less immediate for most of us here today than for more needy and vulnerable people, especially non-Euros, for maximum impact, climate discourse must dramatize how global warming threatens not only far away others, but people like those of its target audiences, who will mostly be privileged denizens of the G20 by schooling, if not by location. So contagion, for example, stresses the anguish of the white middle class American suburban family, where pandemic strikes first. And the end of October foregrounds the personal ordeals of the hero researcher and his wife and children, the family drama as it comes apart. Third, even though the most dire effects of global warming won't be felt by people like us for decades to come, as with pandemic discourse, the threat must be dramatized as an imminent danger to our lives and property not just for distant proxy sufferers like polar bears on shrinking ice sheets and native Alaskans flooded out of coastal villages by rising sea levels. That's not to say that climate imagination should ignore such impacts. I'm a great fan, for example, of the photographer uh, Bonerji's work on the Arctic regions and many Arctic and Antarctic photography is, is, is wonderful and its disclosures of this kind. I'm only suggesting that uh, in, in um, doing that, um, climate imagination must nonetheless also and especially seize hold of what seems most likely to make a mobilizing narrative now for its target audiences. Finally, climate imaginaries of the future have to do their best to offset evocations of bewilderment, catastrophe, and paralysis, however compelling, by scripting pathways toward solution in which legitimacy of both individual and collective action are affirmed. This talk will, this task uh, certainly is going to be the most formidable of all four of the pathways I've mentioned, uh, because it's wishful thinking to expect decisive results like a vaccine breakthrough anytime soon. 
and because it means pushing assertively beyond as well as benefiting from the strong onto epistemological trend in current eco theory, such as, for example, Tim Morton's theory of global warming as hyperobject, Bruno Latour's cartography of existential interactors, human and non human, uh, and the theories of, of dispersed agency proposed by Jane Bennett and um, so called material eco criticism more generally. Brilliant, fascinating, and instructive as these models at best are. Ultimately, they also threaten to entrap one, I think, in mind games, and in some cases, uh, like Morton, uh, also a kind of defeatism. Uh, the biggest single challenge for ecocultural workers of your generations, I would suggest, will be to devise and dramatize viable ecopragmatist exit strategies from those. That's going to happen. I'm sure it will happen, but when it happens, well, that remains to be seen. And largely, it's going to be in the hands of uh, the younger contingents of audiences like you. Uh, so conclude my formal remarks. Thank you very much for hearing me out.